The next presentation will be given by Jason McAllister from Clover Leaf Animal Welfare Systems. Uh, Jason uh, has a lot of experience in the, in the swine industry. He is an animal welfare uh, expert. He's been in the industry since the 90s, I believe. And his company is one of the few ones that actually is approved to certify producers to be compliant with Prop 12. So uh, Jason will give us an, an overview about what it takes to be compliant. So thank you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start this uh, conversation by saying I'm not the enemy. I'm just here to, I'm just here to help you. You know, the government says, we're, we're from the government, we're here to help. Well, I'm not from the government, but I, I am here to help. So, um, a little bit about, about Cloverleaf. Um, we, with Proposition 12, we kind of kept an eye on it. We're, we're an auditing company, that's what we do, a certifying body. That's our, our, our job. We kind of kept an eye on it, saw that uh, the direction it was going, and, and um, in uh, early 22, I, I instructed my, my business partner to figure out what it was going to take to get uh, be prepared to do Proposition 12 certification. So she started working with uh, Lauren Davis. She started working with the state of California, Dr. Cox, to uh, develop, because they didn't even have an audit tool. They had no audit tool. We had to present them with one. So to develop an audit tool and to um, um, kind of do that. We worked with California Pork Producers Association there to develop a self-assessment guide um, so that farmers, producers could kind of have an idea of what it was going to take to be compliant with, um, with the Proposition 12 law. Those are kind of two projects that were running simultaneously. Um, we, have, we were the first company that was announced as uh, an accredited certifying agent by the state of California. <coughs> But I think one of the things is we, we do a lot of we do consult, consulting with the industry around the world, uh, Latin America and a lot of uh, uh, Spanish speaking countries uh, we have for quite some time. One of the things that is part of this is California doesn't allow us to do, as a certifying agent, we're not allowed to do consultation for, for Proposition 12. So uh, that works great for producers. They get it all for free. I am allowed to give it all away for free. All, all the information, as long as it's publicly available, we can give all that information away. And so we've created quite a few guides. Uh, there'll be a QR code at the end of the presentation. I want you to just scan and anything you, questions you might have, we're including this presentation or on that website. So let's see if this works here. Just kind of gonna go through some of the things. The things that I'm finding are, uh, that are, um, that are key definitions, places where producers are struggling with the understanding of, of different parts. Uh, so audit trail, and, and you can read it yourself here, but it, it generally means that the, it has to be sufficient trail of documentation, of all the covered products, that it's able to convince the auditing person that's there that it's reasonably controlled, okay? That's a very vague statement, but that's what you get when you deal with government entities. So, um, sufficient detail to document identification, source, supplier, transfer, ownership, transportation, storage, segregation, handling, packaging, distribution, and sales. Don't miss any of those. Those are the things that we're talking about. As producers, if we're talking about strictly producers, um, you, you need to be talking about when, how your sales came onto your farm, when they left your farm, and they come into the herd when they leave the herd. Those are the types of things there. As a distributor, you've got, you've got to kind of trace all of this stuff back. Compliant enclosure. This is one that comes up quite a bit. It means that the enclosure uh, shall do all of these things. Stand up, sit down, fully extend limbs, turn around freely. That's, that sounds easy, right? 24 square feet. Everybody gets that right. When we go to the farms, uh, pretty much everybody that says I'm compliant when I show up, they say I'm compliant and I measure it out. 24 square feet, that's the easy part. Everybody's getting that right. There's other things that, that here, stand up fully, extend limbs and turn around freely that, that start tripping people up. And we'll, I got some, uh, some visual aids here that'll help you with that. 
Usable floor space is a question that comes up a lot. It's the total usable floor, floor space divided by the square footage. It's pretty simple math. If, you, if, you, if you've got completely rectangle pins and nothing going on, and they're all the same size at your farm, congratulations. I don't know too many farms that every pin is exactly the same. In fact, I don't know that I've ever been to one. But do the math, figure out what it needs to be, and figure out an enclosure space. We recommend that you make a map, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. What's of, of what's compliant so that your when your auditor gets there, they're not spending all day with a tape measure going through. Uh, auditors should be verifying that you're that you're compliant with what you say you're compliant with, and moving on with their their day. Here's another one that comes up. We get this question. I probably answer three calls a day about what is the breed, what's considered a breeding pig. I think it's built in the some of the confusion is built in the way they have this labeled within the system. This says uh, <clears throat> kept for the purposes of commercial breeding with six months of age or older or pregnant. There's, a, there's another part of that. It's not automatically. There's going to flip the switch that flips at six months. So she could be six months old and not be considered part of the herd because production cycle, this is what the next part of that that has to be figured into the, in, into the equation here. So six months of age or older and moved into a enclosure for the purposes of breeding, right? So your GDU, your GDU is exempt as long as you're not breeding in your GDU, right? If you're using you're, if you move her in there for the purposes of breeding, right, you're quick running the AI in before, before you move her into the, the other enclosures, then your GDU is not exempt. But if all you're doing is doing your, your development in there and cycling them up, getting them ready, those types of things, GDU is exempt, doesn't have to be in, in part of that space. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> Once they're moved for the purposes of breeding, they become part of the breeding herd. They leave the breeding herd when they're clearly identified. Okay, so if I'm, if, uh, for example, cold sows, we find cold sows, the question that comes up all the bit, how, how do I know? I don't know, reasonably prove to the auditor that the sow you're ha having your herd has been removed from the cull. If you've got an electronic system, it's very simple. Marker is a cull. Right cull on her back. Put a tag up, different color. Put it on her sow card. There's multiple ways. There's no prescription for exactly what has to be, but she has to be clearly identified reasonably that she is part, not no longer part of the breeding herd. Distributor. So we're talking a little bit about that. <coughs> Engage in the business of commercial sales or distribution for whole pork meat in the state of California. So if you sell them some of your pork. You know, great. You sell it to the distributor. You're not the distributor. You're just a producer. Okay. If you are, a, if you are a distributor, you're selling direct sales to the general public. That makes you a distributor. You have to worry about build all the distributor caveat that if you're not, okay, your distributor will will give you their list of demands. And those, what, what we found is those wildly vary on what the distributor wants, what the distributor expects. I would maintain your chain, right? The suggestion that I have is have the documentation from when that sow enters your herd all the way through when she leaves and all the piglets that come from there, okay? All of her offspring should be tracked. As long as you can do that and you have a certificate, great. End user, this gets kind of a consumer, a final consumer, a retailer that is not a pork producer and only conducts commercial sales directly to a consumer. All right, food processing and, and whole pork meat. Food processing facilities or cottage operations receive whole pork meat solely for use as an ingredient. You know, restaurant food sales. Okay, so if you fall in any of those, if you're selling any of those things, then you might be a in use more. This is it in Spanish. We try to try to do both. I'll give you a second to read through this. Easiest way out when I tell people that if you're not.
home, if someone is to take it home and cook it, you're probably not a distributor. Okay. <clears throat> Steps to certification. Uh, one of the key things that you should know is that it's not automatic. Um, when we talk about certification, you can't just call up somebody and immediately become certified, pay your bill. There's, right? You have to put in an application, and in that application, you'll have to clearly outline um, what animals are within your herd. We'll talk about how that all goes. If you're a distributor, you must register with the state of California. That's different than the application that you have to put in to be third-party audited. So when you're third-party audited, you have to submit an application that you do not have to register unless you're a distributor. There's a whole process for that. You go to the CDFA website and begin the process for distributor certification. Um, as part of your application, if you're a distributor, it's the first thing we're going to ask you. Schedule your audit. There are, we just had a call with uh, CDFA, the aud all the auditing companies did, and <clears throat> there is still some space available in the next few months. Uh, we have space available. I know that there's at least two other auditing companies with, with space available, but the, the window's closing. Time's ticking. And if you're going to be self certified, you're self certified now, and you need to be third party certified by January 1st in order to continue that chain. Keep that in mind. I wouldn't suggest breaking that chain of self certification to third party certification. Though the actual audit has to be performed, we cannot do video audits. The state of California will not allow us, even at the distributor level, to do video audits. We've asked. I'd like to sleep in my own bed, believe it or not. But, you know, as much as I enjoy what's going on, I'd like to sleep at home sometimes. So if I could do some video audits, that'd be great. Pass multiple times and it will not allow it. Um, corrective actions. So this first year, the state of California uh, has said that they will accept corrective actions um, and our, our job as, as certifying agents is to help get you across the line, to educate and provide you with the information that you need. So we're, we're able to do that, we'll just give you a blanket request for certification as we show up and anything that's a deficiency, we're gonna give you a, a, a letter of request for corrective action. So when we come to your farm and we find that you're missing a document or a recorded document, we'll say, okay, hey, you need to have this document. And you say, all right, I'm gonna do that starting today and move forward with your life. Great, we can do that. We'll verify it a couple weeks down the road to make sure that uh, you, you've got it right. Uh, then we'll issue certification at that point. You gotta receive your cert cert certification and your actual certificate, present to distributors, and then you have to recertify every 12 months you get 364 days, it expires on the day it was issued. So yeah. there's, there's no grace period on that. California is not, and if you, again, if you break that chain, it could be, it could be a, a, a period of time when your animals are not, an extended period of time when your animals are not certified. So do not go over on that. Animal confinement, minimum square footage, um, it's 24 square feet or 2.23 square meters. Uh, turn around freely. I'm going to skip to the next slide to talk about turning around freely here. So turn it around freely. According to the state of California means that the animal can be able to turn. I know, I know pigs do not turn like this. Okay? I do. But the state of California says that this is what it, they have to be able to freely turn around. And so that turnaround space should be a minimum of seven feet wide. You know, you can't do a three by kick out. We've had folks take out a center stall, and now it's the, the, the dimensions are technically 24 square feet, but the animal cannot turn around freely. Um, three point turns don't count. They, they don't, California will not accept that the animal can back out and turn around. Okay. <coughs> So open spaces, free stanchions, free access stalls, any of these things are acceptable as long as the animal can back out of it at some point and turn around within the enclosure, okay? So for example, this would work. This is acceptable. Everything that I'm showing you here today has been presented to the state of California and has been accepted by Dr. Cox. So 
but you see it here, it's, it's been accepted. So the animal can back out, even if it's a little ways, but the animal's back out. Now I will tell you, um, we had a customer that asked about moving the animals all the way down to the end. They just, they would make a pen that was an enclosure that held 60 animals and uh, the turnaround was all the way down at the end. So they, they had 60 stalls on each side and then a, an eight by eight turnaround and that was not accepted. So reasonably, keep that in mind, reasonable access to turnaround space. All right, let's go back here. Uh, time and non-compliant enclosures. Anytime you move an animal, the easiest way to remember this is anytime you move an animal into a non-compliant enclosure, which means non-compliant enclosure is less than 24 square feet allowed per animal, cannot turn around freely, okay? So if it's moved into that enclosure for any amount of time and you shut the gate, you have to keep a record of it. It's that simple. There's, there's no requirement while the animal is being moved down the alleyway, thank God. But if you move it into an, into an enclosure for any amount of time and shut the gate where the animal cannot freely leave that enclosure, it is considered a non-compliant enclosure and you, your, the six hour and 24 hour rule kicks in. So six hours in a 24 hour period, 24 hours in a 30 day period, right? You have to keep a record and a running total of that time. Uh, hens enrichment, unrestricted roaming, those, we can talk about that offline if we want to talk about hens, but we're here for the pigs today. Record keeping September 1st, 2022, or two years. I, nobody has it. it. It's just a fact. Nobody has it. I, I think I have one company that I've dealt with that has had um, compliant records all the way back to September 1st, 2022. If you don't have it, start today, right? Start as soon as you can. If you're, if you're wanting to get, uh, and that way you can show your, um, you can show your, you know, your corrective measures already in place and, and it can immediately be accepted. So, um, if not, you'll, you'll get issued a, hey, you need to have this, this documentation. Um, split operations, split operations are fine. You can, some of your animals on your farm can be Prop 12 compliant, some cannot, that's fine. You just have to have a way of clearly defining which is which and how you keep them separate. Right, so you have to have an SOP or something that dictates how you keep them separate. Um, and honestly, from a producer standpoint, that's really has the operations that I'm seeing are the most successful are the split operations because if, if you're 100% um, Prop 12 and an animal suddenly, for whatever reason, she has to come out of that program, what do you do with her? Call her out, that's, it. that's, your, that's your option. And if you're a split operation, you can move that animal in out into the non-compliant part of your operation and, and be fine. You know, you just change it from one designation to the other. Um, so I'm not making any suggestions, but those are the things that I've seen that are successful. All right, so 24 square feet, this is a pretty simple diagram, right? 10 by, the, whatever it is, 14.4, that's 24 square feet for six pigs. Simple, simple mathematics, except Never seen a pen that looks like that, right? It's just an open pen with nothing in it. All kinds of stuff that's going on in there. Uh, one of the questions that will come up later is about the stanchions. Do they take up space, right? We'll, we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so uh, she asked me to talk about dis distributors just a little bit here. Make sure that you're registering with CDFA. It, it cannot be the application for service from your third party art provider is not sufficient for distributors, you must certify with the state of California for that portion. Okay, uh, again, records back to the 2022, um, you can document all of these things, the split operations, make sure that it, it, every distributor I've ever come across is split operation. I don't know, any, I, we haven't found any that are just doing Prop 12 yet. But, um, so split operation, make sure you have a track record trail that keeps it, shows how you keep your product separate traceability. For those of you that are in, in, this, in this world, a simple traceability exercise is what, uh, what demonstrates that for us. So, um, documents, title, all of these manifest, 
these are the things that they're going to be looking for, right? <clears throat> so when the audit, so well, that comes up later on. Sorry about that. We'll move on. Audit includes all covered animals and closures, and not just the sample size. One of the things that we've been asked: Are you just going to look at everything? No, unfortunately. The, in California likes me to get my exercise and I have to walk the entire farm and look in every room. Even if you tell me uh, there's no pigs in that building, I at least got to poke my head in the door and verify that you're not hiding sows in there for whatever reason. So be prepared for that. If you're a split operation, understand that there's no fudging on that. The auditor will be required to look even in the non-compliant house. Okay? So. Uh, corrective actions if necessary. We talked about that a little bit already. I'll, I'll, I'll skip that. Um, so you must register, re-register if your distributor must re-register with CDA prior to expiration. That's the same thing. That's the thing, thing that goes with, with auditing. You can't say, hey, call Jason, I expired tomorrow. I, I need to get that re-up. <laughs> okay. Probably not going to work out. Well, maybe if you live right down the road from St. Joe, I might be able to buzz over and get it done. But generally speaking, take, it takes time. Plan ahead. Schedule that in advance. I would suggest that you start at least 90 days ahead of your expiration for getting it on the schedule. If you can schedule it around your expiration date, it's fine. But get on the schedule because every one of us is, is uh, you know, is challenged with that. So. Um, prior to expiration date, you don't want to don't want to cross that line. One of the things that uh, we find, and this hasn't been so much the case here in America, but in Europe, there's a different set of standards for sows and gilts as far as their reg reg uh, regulations go. And so the gilts or first parity sows have a uh, they're allowed to have a, a little bit smaller confinement space that does not count. All animals within the confinement space um, must be held within the 24 square feet or compliant housing. Um, no matter what it is, in, there is also in Europe we found there's a 24, uh, excuse me, a 10% a, a, a rule for animals that are housed more than 60 animals in a group. That rule also does not apply in the U.S. It's for California standards. It doesn't apply in Europe either, as far as verifying for California standards. 28 days in gestation stalls, that's okay. And even in the UK, it's 30 days in, in, in the EU. It's, it doesn't count here. The 6 to 24 and 24 and 30 rules apply no matter where you're located. Um, lack of complete documentation is what we find. I, one of the key things, and I talked about it today on the, on the uh, interview I did, was you know, in our industry, we've never had a, we've never had a reason to record the day we move the sow from gestation into the farrowing crate. It doesn't serve any purpose, right? We record farrow day, or expected farrow day, you know, we get the day she's weaned, but we've never recorded that. So very few people have that record, but it gets required. The day she's moved into that farrowing crate, she's exempt as long as she's in there five days prior, no more than five days prior to her expected farrowing day. In order for the auditor to verify that, they've got to be able to know what day it was. So we're going to have to start recording that day. And that can be recorded all kinds of different ways. And I've seen some creative stuff. Room cards are okay. A guy showed me cleaning records. Um, you know, the, it's on the sow card. That's great. If you've got electronic systems, some of these electronic feeding systems that kick them out, that's already recorded. You just have to figure out how to get it and show it to the auditor. Um, all of our team is, we, we're getting really creative and helping people give us the answers that we need, finding the answers because they've already got it. Um, you know, but there's there's a bunch of different ways of proving that, and you just have there just has to be one, so uh, reasonably convinced. So date moving the farrowing crate is one that almost everybody has struggled with. So going forward, I'll expect everybody to get it right. Talked about remote audits or anything, even distributors. Uh, distributors have asked the question, is it the office or is it the distribution center? 
it's actually where the product is stored. So if you, your company, your, your, your Acme distributing company, and you have one central hub here in Minneapolis, but you have six around the Midwest, six different distribution centers that you work from, each one of those individuals will have to be audited. It's not, uh, as far as California's concerned, it's not negotiable. So where the product is held, keep that in mind. <clears throat> These are some of the questions that we've received uh, from producers and we've done webinars and different things like that. One of them, is there a time limit on how long a pig can be under 24 square feet during the individual tree? So to, to walk through that a little bit, um, <clears throat> you've taken a sow out because she's got a sore foot. Okay or she's beat up, or whatever reason, you've moved her into individual treatment, she's under veterinary care. The regulations and the, the requirements from California are that an animal has a, has a history, a recorded history, when she was moved into non-compliant housing, what she's being treated for, you got pins, this is a good thing to make it right down. Uh, right, what she's being treated for and what her expected return to the herd date is. And I got into a little bit of a, of a, of a uh, heated discussion on this is I said, well, what is it? Doc, Dr. Cox, Dr. Elizabeth Cox with the CDFA, I said, what is it? What's, the, what's acceptable? Is it two weeks, six weeks? Six months, how long can she be in there? Well, what's a reasonable treatment? Well, I'm not a veterinarian, I'm an auditor. You tell me. Well, there's no reasonable treatment according to according to the standard that she'll accept the longer than 28 days. So keep that in mind. Doesn't mean that as a veterinarian, you can't go back and say, I'm gonna have a new treatment plan for this animal. But Individual treatment plans can't, she won't accept them longer than 28 days. So keep that in mind, do whatever you want. If you have questions, her email address will be at the, on the last slide, and I encourage you to ask any questions you'd like of her. Again, I didn't make any of these rules, I'm just trying to help producers understand how they work and what's going on. to where that 28 days came from? Because that's not in the regulations. Ask her. I'll ask. <laughs> I mean, it's all over. But just keeping them in for a, a, a period of time, she's, she's, she's not accepted. Because I've asked her. I've put it to her and said, hey, I, I had a producer that said, well, she's this salad is being treated because she's, you know, um, um, being abused by the other animals and she's going to be in here until she parents. You will not accept that. So I encourage you to reach out to California if you have discussion points. <coughs> what documentation required to show that breeding sows have not been restricted for more than six hours, 24 hours, in a 30 day period? You'd have to have a reasonable record of when they were placed in and placed out. Some farms are doing free access stalls. If she's in a free access stall and at no point do you push the pin or pull the lever down, you just do your AI just like that, it never needs to be recorded. You're never restricting those animals, it doesn't need to be recorded. If you, as long as that animal can freely come and go, it's not a non compliant enclosure. Does that make sense? Even though it's two by, you know, two by seven and we all know what, what's gonna happen. You put those in a group like that, dominant sow, she's gonna back out into the main alley or out into the out of the main group and everybody else is gonna stay put. Okay, that's fine. As long as if they decide to on their own, they can move out. Keep that. <clears throat> if records are found to not meet the CDFA expectations, will there be time allowed to correct and improve records to satisfy? No, records, it's, it's not about that. There will be a corrective action period that you will be allowed to produce. We will give you time 
to do that. Um, for Globe Relief, we, we require, we give you seven days for to submit and then 30 days to have proof. So in seven days, you're gonna say, hey, Jason, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. And then in 30, within 30 days, you're gonna need to prove that to me. Okay. Cannot issue the certificate until the date that that's proven, so keep that in mind as well. Um, for CDFA, we can't, we're not allowed to trust you. So, <clears throat> how, will it, how will it know if the producer has passed the audit? We're gonna get a certificate. All of the, all of the uh, auditing companies are gonna issue certificates. Um, it doesn't matter which company you choose. There's, I think, seven of us now out there. Um, but each one is required to produce a certificate that has been approved by the state of California. So, as long as you have one of those, it's fine. Uh, we also have, offer a online version that you, you get your certificate and then we have a QR code that you can use to uh, use with your customers. There's a QR code there, it'd be bigger in a minute if that one doesn't work for you. But, we have an online compliance guide that talks about all of the enclosures that we found. Um, throughout the you know the course of the last six months of doing these and different just different things that are approved and what's not approved and kind of goes into a deeper discussion point about about um, um, what each one of those terms means and talks about it again so you can you can go online and, and this this will take you to a website and it'll have all of the forms and everything that you need including this online discussion point that will um, We'll talk about it. So there's the QR code a little bit better. Self-service guide, it talks about, um, you know, everything you need to know. If you have that self-service guide, um, everything should be answered yes before you call your auditor. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There's no 95% uh, on a California Proposition 12 on it. It's all, it's all yes or no. You're either in or you're out on that one. Uh, if you're out, it's, it's, it's strictly corrective measures at this point, as long as you can comply with those um, corrective measures. Um, well, that website's available. There's an audit, there's an audit tool, actual audit tool that we use is on there. Um, there is a, the self-assessment guides on there. The guide that I just showed you that talks about all the different types of enclosures that we found and the different definitions of each are on there, and we also have, um, um, there's the, the application for services on there and then a link to the distributors. Um, so if, you're, if you need to hook up with the state of California to get your distribution signed up there. So. <clears throat> one of the other, um, one of the other things that we're finding, more common things that we're finding with producers not being compliant is uh, the uh, movement of movement of sows back after weaning um, if you and I, don't, I don't know a lot of people that do that but if you do move the piglets out first and the sows in the crate in the farrowing crate on her own after wean the clock does start there as well. So you have to have, you have to have a record of that and it has to be, you know, the, the six and 24 and the 24 and 30 rule on that. Um, one of, another issue we've come across is um, in farrowing crates that are large enough that accommodate the 24 square feet rule plus the turnaround, um, that's great. You never have to keep a record of that. Problem with that is every bit of the floor has it, it has to have it in there without any kind of impediment of her turning around. So crush bars, she's they're not accepting the crush bars in the floor. Um, and that doesn't seem very good because she could just step over it and turn around. That doesn't make any sense to me, but it, it, it's neither here nor there what makes sense to me. They're not accepting the crush bars as as a turnaround, as freely turned around. So if you're expecting that to be the case, it's not the case, it will be considered a, a standard farrowing crate at that. Um, 
One of, another question has been um, watering troughs, feed troughs in the floor. Feed troughs that are in the floor and on the floor are accepted and are counted in the 24 square feet rule. If she can step into it as a choice, it is acceptable. As it, and it is part of, it's not excluded from the 24 square feet. Um, if the box is up here and it somehow impedes her from stepping on the floor underneath, then it has to be excluded. Or the individual or the electronic feeders where they that they go in and out, um, that, because there's a, 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 a no lay down bar in the inside there, which is required, and otherwise it picks out, just lays it out and stays there. But that bar prevents that floor from being counted as usable floor space for this rule. So hit the back out, there's pass-throughs, they're not considering those. The other thing, um, some of the electronic feeders have these large um, stabilizers that come down into the pen to hold them in place. If if they are on the floor, and they do impede the turnaround movement, that, that floor space also has to be excluded. So, um, <clears throat> That just I, I can't I can't tell you all the all the new and exciting ways I've seen uh, people um, try to figure this out and, and come about these rules. Uh, the one thing I'll tell you is that if you're unsure about a definition on something, please reach out. Okay, there's there's lots of help and lots of assistance out there. All of the auditing firms are are, are out there and and they're trying to be as helpful as possible. Um, you know, I think that everybody out there will give you freely give you information and at least answer your questions. Uh, the question not asked is the only, only dumb one, so don't don't hesitate to ask. And it's, I mean, it's fairly expensive to have an auditor come out and, and do this, so you want to you want to make sure that you're you're somewhat prepared for that. Um, again, use that self assessment guide. I don't know if everybody has one of those, but we do, and you're free to use it. It's on this link. No matter who your audit company is, they're all going to be, all the questions, they're going to be worded maybe a little bit differently, but they're all the exact same questions. Um, there's, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know uh, what else I can, can give you on those things, but. Uh, you can open it. For yeah, I think there's probably probably a lot of questions. I'll, I'll stand here in the hot seat. Well, first of all, yes, thank you. <laughs> Marjorie, we want to open it for as much debate as possible. We have plenty of time. For the split coal farms, do pigs have to wean from a crop 12 compliant sow? Or can crop can they be cross fostered to a non compliant sow? That's a great question. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. That's, that's, that's something I can get you the answer to. I just don't know them right off the top of my head. When well, I said that's a great question, that, that is. That's one I haven't heard yet. So um, I, I could I could take a guess, but I, I'd be wrong, so I'm not gonna. I, that's that's the other thing that we'll do is we'll we'll make sure that uh, you know if I can't answer the question, I know who can. So I, I will get in contact with uh, Dr. Cox and ask that question. We've done that a lot. I I kind of went uh -huh, I don't know. Let me ask. You know because. I, I'm not making these rules up, but I'm not making any judgments on things. If I don't know the answer, I'm not going to give you the wrong one. So. But along the same lines, can a sow be in and out of compliance during the cycle? During those? So as long as you, she always has one piglet on, you can cross foster her and she stays in, she stays in compliance with no problem. If you, if you take her out, the six hour rule starts. But you take all the piglets out, you put another one in, you, you put the next set in or put others in for her to foster. She, according to the law, she can, she can stay there. And, and she's compliant, all the piglets are compliant. But that's what you mean. If you're talking about cross fostered onto a non-compliant sow, I don't, I don't think so, but I don't know. I'll be wrong with my answer, so I won't. <laughs> you ask the question. I don't think the milk
when you have styles enter uh, non-compliant enclosure in a group setting, so for example for breeding, can you need to record at the individual cell level or can you record at the group level how much time they're in enclosure? So that, that is a great question. Um, you can record at either way, is, is fully acceptable. Um, if you record as a group, you can't, um, you, that's fine, no problem, but you, you can't individualize later, if that makes sense. The group time still sticks with their individual time as well as, as it would. So if I have group A of, of sows come in, you have to, if you're gonna call them group A, you have to be able to demonstrate you understand which sows are in group A. Um, you know, whatever ear tag, back tag, uh, and we've been to some Mennonite farms where they had names. Okay, fine. Whatever that is, you, you, you've got that in there. Um, and identify that, but so she was in group housing for five hours and then we moved her over here for 15 minutes to do something else. Her total time is five hours, 15 minutes, and that has to be recorded. The group can just be five hours. That, that answers the question. Is self-certification possible? What's that? Self-certification possible? So self-certification is possible until January 1st, December 31st. You can, um, you can self-certify up until then. And in fact, I, if I was, I would, I would surely be self-certified. I was in your position. Want to continue that chain self-certified to certified third-party certified there are certain uh, rules that you said that uh, that we I mean we're not compliant on but supposedly we are already certified as a prop dog farm so in case that another auditor came like next year could it be like a different auditor like like more strict or how does that work? Because, for example, uh, the time of the of the win uh, when we need to empty that, um, to empty the, the crate, and then the 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 time just started, right? Uh, but we didn't have that documentation. I mean, but the auditor said it was okay. So it could be get another auditor and say, no, basically this is how we do it. Okay, so I mean, you could have a you could have an auditor that's incorrectly auditing mm -hmm. and certifying you incorrectly. That that absolutely could happen, but it can't they can't over certify you. They can't require you anything outside the law, no matter who the auditor is. And if you have, there are ways of of uh, going about that. So if you have an issue where an auditor were to come out and do scope creep or get outside of their their audit then you can contact the audit company first or, or just straight to the state of California. But it, it, I guess the onus falls on you to make sure you're compliant. Uh, if, if you have a, if you know, especially if you know that you, you're not compliant and an auditor said you're compliant, I would be wondering why. Yeah, right. And also, the, you said about the, those cross bars, uh, I just last, I think last month, my supervisor was saying that it was going to uh, get those, so it, be, it doesn't like crush any like, or lay, we have like less laid on, so there might be some misconception in the industry, because this is the first time that I hear that, like the crush bar thing. Yeah, absolutely, I, I agree that there is. Um, there, there, there is, but it has, she has to, really be able to turn around. Dr. Cox did address that in our latest webinar. It is online, you can, you can uh, hear it straight from the horse's mouth on that. I knew when we found it, we, we found it at a farm, uh, we deemed it, actually that's what happened. We deemed it compliant, but the audit, uh, the company that we were auditing for was using uh, Cloverleaf and CDFA as, um, as both, and we're getting some free audits from, from CDFA. By the way, you can get free audits scheduled. They've got time on their schedule as well. So if you want them, they'll come out and do it. But they were, they were more strict than we were. They wouldn't accept them. And 
guy came to me and said, hey, what's this? And I, I said, well, they can step over it. That was common sense to me. But then I took it to California, and she said, no, it's not. And so we had to go back. I had to go back and, and to the customer and say, well, I guess I was wrong. I'm sorry. We haven't changed these things. We found a couple of items like that over the course of the last six months where as it's developing, it's become a little bit. And I think we'll continue to find those things. We'll try to be open about it when we do. So just what's the average cost of an audit to, for the for an average herd? Do you charge uh, by the day or by the hour plus travel? Or are you you're talking about free audits? I'm confused. OK. Uh, great. The, the, the state of California CDFA, uh, if you contact them, will perform uh, audits. I don't know what their schedule is or what their availability or budgeting is, but they do not charge for the audit itself. I think you have to pay for travel expenses. I'm not, check with them, but it's, uh, um, they, can, they can do that. For the rest of the auditing companies, um, my company currently in the 2022 prices is $1,000 per audit day. And that can include up to five audits in a day, um, depending on your biosecurity plan. Um, some of these smaller sites that we've been to, we've done five full, five full audits in a day at that price. Uh, and some biosecurity plans, we it's like every other day. So depending uh, depending on uh, on what your what your site is, you can go from there. How your biosecurity plan goes from there, and everybody is charging. For uh, travel and transportation. Do you have auditors scattered around the country? I have auditors scattered, scattered around the world. So, uh, we have 10 here in the U.S., uh, in Europe, and in, in uh, Latin America. Uh, as an independent veterinarian, can we get certified to perform audits? Absolutely. Anybody, anybody who has. I mean, there's some audit, there's some criteria for doing that um, to be to be an accredited certifying agent for the state of California. It's not easy. It's it, it'll be a hundred percent bald before you're done. This is a wig that I'm wearing today. But um, it's uh, yeah, you can do it. It's totally totally available. And I think that as we as we come along, um, there'll be more and more people out there. We've gone, we were the first ones back in February, it was released. I think we were only one for about 60 days. And then just like that, there was four more. And now there's seven. I know for a fact that there's four more in the pipeline. So um, yeah, absolutely. Anybody that uh, has some, meets the accreditation uh, standards can do it. You're looking for a job, give me a call. <laughs> So definitely know you gotta record ins and outs of say a free access lockup for breeding, right? But I thought I heard you mention earlier you also have to keep a running total for each sow? Or, okay, so that has to be written or documented somewhere. So you have to keep that running total in that, so you don't exceed that 30, that 24 hour and 30 day period. And I don't know if anybody's doing it multiple times a day, but you, know, you might do four hours a day, and four hours tomorrow, and four hours you know, on the third day. That's pretty common. Stuff. And that's that 12 hours there if we're talking about that has to be recorded uh, and that could just be all in one sheet it, but for the purposes of an audit it's not acceptable to have to do that math while you're operating it ha you have to have the number there we'll do the math oh. just so you don't exceed it you know, I, I mean it would be we, we prefer convenience get us in and out of your hair as fast as possible that's what I tell people a lot, too, is if you have the map, if you have the map and you're plotted out with all of your dimensions, what I'm going to do or what one of the total leaf auditors is going to do is they're going to come in and they're going to pick two pins at random and verify that your dimensions that you've told us match what's on your map. We're going to put the tape measure away and just take your measurements from there going forward. If we don't have those things, then we don't have any choice but to measure them. You can't, not allowed to eyeball them.
makes it much easier, much faster. Um, you comment too that there is no grace period, right? So you have to be in ongoing certification. Mm -hmm. right. What would happen if you are out of compliance for 10 days, let's say? Who is out of compliance? Uh, how does that work? Mm -hmm. We're gonna come to that bridge. We haven't got there yet. I, well, I've asked Doc too, I don't want, look, the thing that worries me I don't know the answer, but the thing that worries me is that they, there's gonna be someone that says, you know, every every animal in that system is not compliant until you come around on the next cycle. I don't know. I don't know that answer. I don't know if that's the right answer or the wrong answer, but that's what I'm concerned about. So my suggestion is to 100% do not break the chain from self-compliant or self self-certified third party certified and that timeline as it states. From as a timeline perspective, if I go from self-certified to third party certified, there's no break in the chain, all of that, all of that, all of those animals within that system are certified. Don't break the chain. Okay. Um, more questions. You talked about sows being able to move to an area that they can turn around freely, but you said it has to be a reasonable di distance. What is considered reasonable? It's individual. Uh, so reasonably convince the otter that the animal can move back and forth. There is no standard, there's no regulation. Uh, I, I know I've had people present me with 10 times the, 10 times the sow's length and that's that's been the, what we what we've done, but it's a big. There is no there is no uh, actual written. It's a reasonably convincing audit. It's a scary place to be. As an auditor, as an auditor and auditing company, we don't we don't want gray area. We don't want any of that stuff. I want black and white. I want to be able to say it's binary, yes or no. Either is or it is. But there are. Asking those questions of the state of California and getting them on record would be super. I think you said it at the beginning, but can you clarify when gills become part of the, they need to be, you know, part of the cycle? Is it six months or is it at the first breeding? Or when, when is it? There's an and in there. Six months and move for the purposes of breeding. So both? No. Or if it's four months, and if you move them into breeding, they become part of the herd. But move them into a, a crate, or actually breed them. Okay. Move them for the purposes of breeding. That's the way. That's those are the exact words. If they're moved for the purposes of breeding, so what's considered breeding? Is it, is it AI? Is it heat check? Is it all of these things? And for us, we we determined that breeding is breeding. AI. That's it. You're doing the breeding, move them in the, in, into a stall for the purposes of breeding. Great. Right. Okay. <laughs> More questions. That wind um, to service interval, then it's covered. It's, so the sounds don't go out of the uh, green cycle during that time, right? So. Still should stay, everything stays in until they actually leave the herd. It becomes part, they enter the herd when they're moved in for the purposes of breeding, then they leave the herd when they're marked out as cull or sold or transferred to non compliant animals. So if, if you're in a split, if you're a split operation and for whatever reason you got to move her out, great. That's the, that's the benefit of the split operation for, um, for the, you know, the treatment purposes. You know, so if you have her confined, you don't have to worry about whatever. If you if she needs to be confined until she barrels, you just you can move her out of out of the Prop 12 herd. In that in that situation, when you're in a situation where you're you know 100% locked in, then what do you do? You kind of you kind of stuck there. In that example where you move the sow out of that cycle, can you still bring her back in the next cycle? That's the way. So if she if she's moved out, her and all of her offspring have to be have to be moved through before you can move back. She could be reintroduced. She could. Okay. That was the same question I had. Okay. Great.
things to think well, about. She has to, yeah, her and all of her offspring have to be, so if you move her mid, mid cycle, right, she has to farrow out before she can be moved back in and all of those offspring have to have to be out. Not too many people doing that, but whatever reason there is. I've seen all kinds of stuff. People say, oh, we never do that. <laughs> Just until we find it. So I go around the corner and it's like, oh, there it is. But just, you know, I guess the thing, the thing um, is to make sure that you you know what your what those definitions are and to be be prepared. Follow that self-assessment guide. If you have questions, we're available. State of California is available. And and those are official answers. I, I like people that ask those questions because when you ask them officially, if you get official answer, answers, then that kind of sets that standard, right? It's, it's, it's great. We want to eliminate all. And so if you're finding ambiguity or differences in auditing, please point it out, because none of the auditing companies want to be different. Anytime we find it, we get on a call and I'm like, hey, what are you doing with this? You know, or I talk to Dr. Cox, like, what, what's the deal with this? Why is this different? Because we don't want any any gray area. We don't want any change. I don't want to be the, known as the easy company or the hard company or, or any of that. It's just a law, binary, black or white. And if it's not, then what do you talk about to figure out? Uh, talking about uh, the ESF systems, um, you you said uh, we 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 need a. Uh, uh, more clarity in the information about the about if the system is allowed allowed to 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 complain the, the space is, the, the style uh, complain with the with the law. So what happened if uh, one company one company are agree with the, with this kind of uh, of ESF? Another company is not agree with this uh, with this kind of, of uh, equipment. This is because some some stalls, some stations for uh, for some ESF are very different between 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 other. Uh, my question is is uh, uh, we need more clarity about the information for the law, not uh, for. Um, for self-interpretation for the companies that certificate. So right here, <laughs> sir, website, well, this email address right there. Get your get your questions asked straight to that question, animalcare at cdfa.ca.gov. That's, that's where if you need those clarifications on those things, that's where I would suggest you start. So same same email address, just right. E Cox in the front of it. Okay, Dr. Cox, straight out, straight out of the gate. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, just ask those questions. If you're finding any type of um, any any type of variance, nobody wants that. The CDFA doesn't want it either. So let's let's get it figured out and get it hammered out. Maybe one last question before the break. Uh, what sort of, obviously you have to keep track of a lot of things, right? What sort of creative ways the, um, that you've seen um, producers employ that you would like to share? Any, any thought or any new things coming up to keep track of all these movements? Any creative ideas well, you want to share? Like I said, a lot of these, a, a lot of the electronic systems now um, have the capability. You, you do, uh, if you have those systems in place, and you don't have everything that you need to be compliant on, on, on this record, reach out to your software dealer, whoever you're getting that from, and tell them you need it. It's as simple as making that switch, they, them to just turn it on that you need that information tracked. I've seen that, and, and, uh, and I don't use any particular name brands, but I have seen it in several name brands where all they had to do was ask, and they turn it on, and okay, that's available to us right now. So please, if you have that information, great. But the other the other side of that coin is, I have literally accepted records that were hand written in pencil on a log sheet in a in a spiral notebook. It, it doesn't have to be that technical, 
It just has to be recorded. You have to take the time to do it. So it's about what ease of what ease of, of you know making those records that you want to do or you can afford to do or any of that. But there's no there's no law that says you have to have electronic records or that pencil doesn't work because pencil does work. I've certified lots of farms written in pencil. So. <coughs> I think we're going to leave it here, so if you want to please join me in thanking Jason and Michael. And Michael. I hope you found uh, this session informative. Uh, it's time for a break. Uh, we'll reconvene at 4.30. And there should be coffee and good stuff by the exhibitor space. So thank you. Thank you.